I am not anti-technology. I do not teach, promote, or endorse abstinence from technology. First of all, it would be unrealistic. So my platform and what I work on and what I try to teach and what I try to give skills is healthy device management and the practice of good digital citizenship, meaning uh, trying to ensure that we behave behind the protection and veiled communication of screens and devices the same way as we would IRL, as the kids say, in real life. Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm Kirkland Newman, and if you, your loved ones, or clients suffer from mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor attention, mood swings, exhaustion, etc., I interview the leading integrative mental health practitioners from around the world to help you understand the root causes of these symptoms, many of which may surprise you and suggest solutions to help you heal. If you like this interview, please do subscribe and forward to others who might find it helpful. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. Dr. Don Grant, thank you so much for being here on the Mind Health 360 show. So Dr. Don Grant is a media psychologist. He's an internationally award-winning media psychologist, published researcher, addiction specialist, and he's the director of outpatient services for Newport Healthcare. He's also chairman of both the American Psychological Association Device Management and Intelligence and Strategic Planning Committees, and he's the president-elect of the APA division the Society for Media Psychology and Technology. And he's been commissioned by the APA to write the only book on healthy device management and the practice of good digital citizenship, which they plan to publish. So there's so many other elements to your biography. You've done so much, and I'm going to put all those in the show notes. But I think for now, let's just leave it at that. You're a total expert on media, psychology, social media, technology, and you were one of the participants in the Mind Health 360 healthy device, sort of, you know, how to navigate technology and devices for our mental health, which we put on with the How To Academy a couple of years ago, almost. So Mm -hmm. in May, 2019. Mm -hmm. And we haven't released that yet. And before releasing that, we wanted to acknowledge the fact that over the last year, things have just changed completely. We're completely dependent on technology. We're completely glued to our screens, whether it's kids, adolescents, adults. We're on Zoom all day. We do pretty much everything on our screens. Mm -hmm. And so my question to you is, you know, my two boys are on their screens 16 hours a day, as far as I can see. I'm sure it's not healthy. And the contrast with what we've been trying to do, which is deal with sort of technology addiction, the threats of social media, which you and Mandy Saligari were helping us with, to now where, you know, there's no way that we can ask kids to get off their devices. They're on their devices all day. We're on our devices all day modeling things. So my question to you, Don, is what do we do now? How do we navigate the fact that we're all forced into the situation, which frankly is not that healthy from a mental health perspective. What are the things that we can do to make this transition smoother and to ensure the mental health of ourselves, our kids, our adolescents in this new world, essentially? Right. And first, I want to say thank you. Um, What you do and the work you do is exceptional and spectacular. And the way you approach it and that you have such commitment and such intelligence and insight and commitment and dedication and passion for this is so uh, I'm so appreciative and grateful for you because the people who do what I do really need people like you to do what you do. Otherwise, we're just a bunch of talking heads and we don't really get to expose what we're doing, our work and our research. I couldn't be, as the kids say, a bigger fanboy of you and your work. And I actually want you, you to, you might want to take, take this, uh, your boys are only on their devices 16 hours out of 24. Wow. That's, that's fantastic. I mean, you look, look, we'll take the wins where we can get them. Right. But what you, um, what you brought up has been, of course, the question for people who do what I do and for me, because we're trying to talk about, and I just want to put this umbrella as I always do over everything. I am so not anti-technology. I love technology. I love devices. I love the platforms. I mean, I'm all in. I got the earbuds. I got phones. I've got laptops. I'm not anti-technology. 
I do not teach, promote, or endorse abstinence from technology. First of all, it would be unrealistic. So my platform and what I work on and what I try to teach and what I try to give skills is healthy device management and the practice of good digital citizenship, meaning uh, trying to ensure that we behave behind the protection and veiled communication of screens and devices the same way as we would IRL, as the kids say, in real life. So I just want to make that clear to your audience that I'm not up here or here trying to say um, what has happened in the last year. It's the best word I can use is ironic for what me and my colleagues do because we're trying to teach healthy device management. And suddenly, unexpectedly and without precedence, we became so dependent and increasingly reliant on these devices. So, and I wanna say, and I mean this, I am so grateful for that, for the devices, which is, a, it's kind of a dialectic where it's like, on the one hand, I feel one way, but on the other hand, I'm so grateful because I've been saying to people, could you imagine, I mean, no one saw this coming. No one could have seen it coming, but could you imagine if this had happened 10 years ago and we did not have the ability to connect even through video, we could, use, we could have used phones, we could have used emails, we could have done texting, but could you imagine? So even though it's been really rough, I'm actually really grateful that we've been able to have these devices. So I wanna put that over everything that we're gonna talk about because I want people to know that that's how I feel. However, it's all about a few things. And the first thing that I've been telling people as a thesis for to answer your question is, no one's thriving this year. Well, maybe Jeff Bezos, but he just stepped down from it. I mean, who knows? Uh, maybe Amazon's doing it and there's people who are, but we need to manage our expectations. We need to really be open to the idea of being flexible, being adaptable, being kind to ourselves and to others, cutting ourselves a break on a lot of things and not, and, and realizing that the race has paused. So this race that we've all been in, it's paused and everyone has had to sit down and wait. Some people have gotten up and, you know, done things, but we're all in this together. So the idea of being able to manage our expectations, be flexible, but then try to normalize in an abnormal situation. And I'll tell you that a lot of the things that we've now become reliant on were things that people who do what I do, we knew this was coming. Things like academic learning online, things like careers and employment, commerce and consumer, all of the platforms and silos but we thought it was gonna be an organic evolution over about 10 to 15 years. But suddenly last late winter and spring, it all collapsed. And we inorganically were all thrust into being reliant on our screens and our devices and the platforms they deliver. So here is the big question, ready for it? What we're now trying to figure out and, and look at is what, because we're in it now. You know, when they say hindsight is 2020, well, actually, it literally is this year. Hindsight is 2020. So the idea of the question that I've been asking and I've been looking at this whole time is what in the future not now. And as researchers, you know, you, I, I've been saying the research for this year, I've been telling my colleagues and some really incredible people that I work with on some research teams, I've been saying, I don't know, when we clean the data, our use and, and reliance and how we've engaged and, you know, on screens in 2020, from a research point of view, when you look longitudinally, will be an outlier. Mm -hmm data from this year will be able to be looked at and we're so interested in research. I don't know if it's going to be legit. So what we're going to be looking at in the future and what we're trying to predict now is what, because of what happened, will be a forced inorganic adaptation of use and utilization of devices. 
especially for the digital immigrants who were resistant, rejecting, overwhelmed, intimidated. I'll give a pedestrian as it gets to a basic example. People who said, I would never grocery shop online. I like to pick my vegetables. Now they've learned how to do it. People who worked from home, who never worked from home, I mean, and now are working from home and employers were ready to say, oh my God, they're going to be sitting around eating bonbons all day. How do we monitor and have oversight? And employees now having to manage the new normal of being in their home space and working from home. And a lot of them like it. I've had especially women who said, "Um, I don't even know if I could fit into my high heels anymore. I love not having to get up and get dressed. And, tra- and traffic and commuting, people are really liking, at least in the United States and LA, that this can work, of working distally and remotely. So what's going to be an inorganic forced adaptation, even for people who are resistant? And then what are these platforms in this use and utilization are going to now be adoptions of behavior? Will people continue to work from home? We will always now have the capabilities to do online schooling. The prejudice against especially higher education of colleges, I would never go to an online school college, gone. But there'll always be these capabilities now for everything we're doing. So what we're looking at is when we do return to whatever the normal is, because Anne Rand was right, Atlas shrugged. She was just like a few decades early. So once the world rewrites, we can't go back and people are not gonna go back to completely non-device use. So that's what we're looking at now, especially, and for online learning, you know, the equity of assessments, some kids struggle with the online learning and that's really hard, but it's always gonna be an option now. Commerce, small businesses, you know? So they've really struggled. But so that's really the big question that we're trying to figure out. Now there's no going back and there won't be. Now we're in it. So that's what we're looking at now, because one of the things that we really want is not to forget Mm -hmm. how important it is to return to the IRL in real life. Even though this may feel more comfortable, it's really important that we also remember that other way. Because I think that's the thing, like there are definitely upsides to this working remotely. And I think we've all felt that, like we've all really enjoyed, well, a lot of us have enjoyed staying at home and not having that commute and not having to, you know, yeah. I mean, especially if you're slightly introverted. And um, I think a lot of people have, have really enjoyed that. But then, you know, obviously there are a lot of downsides as well. And so I think what I'm interested in is, you know, what is the impact on balance to people's Mm. mental health, because on balance, you know, on balance, you know, there are a lot of benefits to people's mental health, to being able to be at home and being in a calmer, more peaceful environment, hopefully. Although, you know, I shudder to think some people's domestic situations are really terrible and incredibly stressful. But generally, you know, on balance, I think people have had a sense of greater comfort and, and peace from being at home. But then the other the other side is that, you know, people are on Zoom all day. Kids are on Zoom all day. We don't have that social engagement that is so regulating for us mammals. Or do we? I mean, do we have it? We don't have it probably as much on Zoom, but we still have some of it. But, you know, and for kids, what is the impact on their mental health? And the other problem, I think, as a parent is that, you know, how do you monitor whether your kid is doing online schooling or whether your kid is actually playing video games, you know, and that's a tricky thing. Indeed. All of this, this is so great. Now, everything you said comes under a basic heading of boundaries. Mm. For example, because I keep it super real, let's go to working at home. Yes, it's much more comfortable, except what what is the great benefits? You can be more comfortable. You don't have to commute. Certainly in terms of let's just go, let's look at all of the different things, critical thinking. For the climate, Los Angeles has had better air quality for the last year than we probably had in decades because of the traffic. So and the idea of being able to be more relaxed, however, that interaction with your peers, with your colleagues, the now having to email or call when you used to walk up the hall and ask a question. And now it's these threads of emails and I've come up with ways to teach how to streamline those things. 
um, the camaraderie, the being in the space, all of that. And that was all my research about community. So I don't think that it's actually the best way because working together with others and being there. But then there's the boundaries. And let's keep it real. So employers, and they talk about it. They're worried now that their employees, they have no oversight. What are they doing at home all day? employees are some of them are feeling this and getting over stressed out. So they're working more. They're sending emails and like, they're admitting this to me. They're sending emails at nine o'clock at night that they could have sent at three just to have documentation. So it looks like they're working because they're so worried. Their bosses think they're sitting around eating bonbons. There have been people, including my, Oh, I can't say who it's my daughter. Um, who's working harder probably than she has, but she's, we're talking about the people are clocking and clocking into their portals in case someone checks to see while they're doing other things. Mm. But people are working perhaps more and some may not be, but it's this, where are the boundaries now? Are people taking lunch hours? The steps and the exercise we get, which we don't even think about for kids in school, just walking around, for people walking and going to work, we're all now become so sedentary. So across biological, psychological, sociological, academical career and environmental silos, you could argue, and we don't have to go into this now, it could be another show maybe, where we can go through and discuss how there's good and bad on each of those different areas of our life that this is impacted. So it's about looking at how does a hybrid work, but it's about boundaries. Cause do you find yourself, you know, working more? Do you find yourself answering more? Certainly emails and communication. Cause you can't just walk up the hall anymore. Kids can't ask the teacher a question and they're not the zoom fatigue. Big time. So, and for, if you, we can talk about whatever you want, but you know, the academic piece, is a whole thing. And now hopefully we'll be coming out of it soon and kids will return to school, but just the developmental stage of socialization, depending on where these kids are, or for some of the high schoolers, like my juniors and seniors are panicking. Should they go off to college? Should they defer? They're not getting the exposure for the athletes, the artists, the scientists of those prizes they can win by having competitions and having recruiters come and see them. So I proposed something which is probably preposterous and I waited, but I've been saying to parents, look, you don't have to do this. But if it turns out that next year we decide to redshirt, to use an athletic term, some of the kids and, and repeat third grade or fifth grade or do a hybrid of third and fourth grade next year. Again, no one's thriving. No one's doing better than anyone else. So if you feel that your child needed that important third grade socialization, or if you feel like your high school sophomore really needed those recruiters or those uh, competitions or those whatever they do to get scholarships and get, you know, or, you know, we could just all become like influencers, which we used to call posers, by the way, people. Um, or um, like, I want to do this show of influencers 2020. Where are they now? Because the show influencers like a minute. Or, oh my gosh, maybe I'll just get a TikTok video that'll go viral and then I'll like, won't have to worry about. But it's all about trying to normalize in an abnormal. So there's all sorts of strategies and skills I give parents about trying to normalize school. You talked about a parent. Parents suddenly are home. And it's funny. I, mean, I don't mean this any disrespect because I'm a parent. We all love each other. But suddenly the kids were locked up with the people they hate, their parents. The parents are locked up together. And some of them are like really looking at each other going like, what? No one's working. Everyone's fear. Everyone's scared. No one knows what's coming next. And the parents now suddenly have had to become teachers and monitors of the school and they're ill prepared for this and the kids are sitting in front of these screens and you don't know what they're doing yeah. so i have a whole set of skills and strategies that probably hopefully will become moot very soon that i've been talking about all year of how to normalize a school day for the kids and we can talk about that or we can talk about anything you want i would love to hear your advice for parents because i think that would be incredibly useful you know because parents are trying to do their own jobs at home on zoom 
And meanwhile, you know, act as teachers and babysitters and cooks and everything for the kids full time. Yeah. Any advice that you can give us? Is this going to increase screen addiction? You know, and how can we essentially help our children to navigate this? So how, you know, tips for us parents and help tips right. for the kids. <laughs> that okay, would- again, hopefully, hopefully they'll get back to school. But to normalize it, I say, again, try to manage your expectations. Because, yes, I don't know about you. I've had, I've seen, like, I'll be with my colleagues and suddenly they'll be Zuna bombed by one of their kids saying, mommy, daddy, caregiver, you know, and they're trying to be in a meeting. <laughs> we all know it. So let's all just forgive each other and know that we're all doing the best we can. We're doing the best we can. No one's got this lot. I'm supposed to be an expert on this. I've been spending the whole year beta testing, coming up with strategies on the fly, but I found some that work. So my suggestions are try to normalize the day. Now, for example, this is going to sound silly. And I've had people say, oh, they've admitted to me. They rolled their eyes when I said this one, but then they did it. I say, say that you've got a kid. And I don't know in the UK, but here, you know, kids, I'm sure it works there too. You walk your kid to the bus stop and they get on the bus and go to school. If that's a transportation. I've been telling parents, so normalize the school day. It's not like let's sleep in and let's miss. So wait, they need to wake up at the same time because we have to keep them in the rituals and routines of what we're going to return to, hopefully, right? So I say, no, it's no different. They just don't have to, you know, get up. Maybe they can spend 20 minutes, you know, sleeping longer because they don't have to transport. But make them get up, make them get groomed, make them act like they're going to school. They don't get their device, like I always say, until they've finished, they're woken up, they're dressed, they're, yeah, they brush their teeth, whatever it is that your, your hygiene is in the morning, and they have at least something for breakfast. Then they can have their device for a few minutes. I tell the parents of the kids, walk them to the bus stop, mm-hmm. even though there's no bus. Walk them out to it. People thought I was nuts, and then they called me and said, oh my God, that actually works. Get the, walk them out, they'll get a, like, Uh, 50 steps of exercise because the kids are too sedentary walk them to the stop walk them back pack their lunch put it in the lunch box like you would i'm talking about the younger kids right but normalize that day also do not let them to be doing their home their schoolwork in a room in their bedroom in their bed set up an area in your house somewhere that's public now the other problem is and this is heartbreaking because of the digital divide Right now, we've got, you know, families who are in smaller spaces. They've got several children. They're all trying to, you know, get online. They're all trying. They might be sharing computers. There's a lot of noise. So that's difficult. So creating a space, I want to be really sentient and respectful of that because most families don't have the resources. And now the kids are all together and and the parents are home as well and everyone's trying to work. So if you can, just try to find a, a, a space but in the best of all possible worlds, um, set up a space for them. And if you have several kids, then set up a little classroom area. And I know it's going to feel like Lori Ingalls Wilder, one room schoolhouse where all the kids of all the grades were together, but try to set up little areas in a public area. And then you have the kids sit there. And when a class is done, see when we're in brick and mortar schools, Every class we go into has a different smell, a different feel, a different, you have different friends. I'm talking about if you're not in elementary school, but you move around and you socialize. But for especially for the middle school and high school kids in, in America, they go from class to class. Your mind re- resets. Besides the fact that you're getting exercise, walking around, you're getting socialization. When Say that you go into your first class. And you love that class and all your friends are there. You're going to have a different sense of dopamine and a different feel for that classroom. Then that class ends. You get up, you gather your things. There's a closure. You get up and you socialize with friends. You go to the next class. Now, maybe the next class, you're not not your best subject. You've got a little anxiety. You didn't do your homework. But it still changes your brain. These kids are sitting for eight hours, not moving, going from class to class and then like, And not focusing. So trying to normalize and walking around when each class is done, get them out or each subject, walk them around the block, walk them around the house, go through a Frisbee. I'm making this up. Whatever it is that would mimic what they do when they're in school and then sit them back down and give them breaks. So um, keeping the school hours, you know, during lunchtime, if you have, if they have friends, 
try to set up little Zoom sessions where you set up your things and the kids can have lunch together at a table, but they're all together on screens. And then when lunch is over, they're done and they go back to school to replicate. Look, it's not perfect and ideal, but trying to replicate as much as we can and normalize it. Um, small study groups. So if they do have friends who are in the same classes with them, maybe after school you set up through Zoom or if it's safe, and I'm not trying to tell people what to do because people need to stay with their family pods, but set up uh, study groups through remote and video platforms where they can sit and they can talk around a table, not in their room. Do not let these kids be doing their homework or doing school from their bedroom, in their bed, turning off their video because I know we all don't like looking at each other. And that's just some of the things, um, let's see, oh, 100%, super important. They're in school. This is not vacation, kids. So I tell parents, please turn off, put on the notifications, the, whatever your, your, your device is. And again, it's so hard because a lot of parents don't have, you know, multiple devices. But, you know, pause, do not disturb, sleep mode, block all incoming messages, all of those things. Put it on whatever your, your computer or your laptop or whatever screen you're using that they're doing school. Oh, absolutely. While they're in school, you should be going in there, is my opinion, and blocking all of the incoming messages like they were in school. Because when they're in school, I know the kids do it, but I don't endorse it. They're getting messages. They're on social media. No, that should all be just pause or put do not disturb. Again, every, every I don't know what people use, but certainly on Apple products, you can put on a sleep mode, you can put on a do not disturb, you can put on, you know, all kinds of things while they're in school, so that they cannot get incoming messages that ambush them, they won't be writing outgoing messages, and they can't, you know, have be distracted by all of that. So that's one of the important things that I think you should do that right away, if nothing else, just remove that temptation. And it's super simple to do it to go in and put an hour sleep mode or an hour block mode or an hour do not disturb for incoming messages or texts or things like that. Totally. No, that makes total sense. That's helpful. But then would you then allow after a full day of school them to go on their devices and do their gaming and do their usual things that, you know, often they come home from school mm -hmm. and then they're like, we just want a game, you know? So would you say that's okay? And they can, after being the whole day on a computer, they can still do their gaming. So here's the deal. Again, um, the other thing I tell parents to do is like you do check their backpacks every night, make sure, make them take their backpack and sit it down next to their computer and their little desk or table area. But like we do with the younger kids or I don't know, whatever, maybe the older kids as well. The night before, check their backpack, make sure everything's in there. They use that, check their homework. Now, if a kid finishes school, I do not do not endorse that they should just finish school and be have their little eyes and glued to these screens and then immediately go right, which is what they want to do. They want to go right into gaming or whatever their social media. I need them to at least take a break, at least an hour, 45 minutes if you have to walk around. Make sure that, you know, make them do a little chore around the house, get them moving, get their brain changing, get them some exposure, get them some fresh air. Because most kids, when they finish school, what is the ideal thing that we would love for all our kids to do? So say the class finishes, Kiki, what do you want? Them, what, do, what do most kids or what do we, what would we love and what do we want them to do after school? Play, Play. extracurricular activities soccer, drama, science club, you know, whatever it is. And they also leave school and then they walk around and they socialize a little bit. They get some fresh air. They do some movement, even if they're just walking to the car or walking home. But kids don't go right from their last period in, in school. They don't stay at school and start gaming. Yeah. So I know it's difficult because there's not a lot of opportunities. And I've tried to get really creative with showing dance videos and all kinds of things that there's to do. I've come up with a million ways of how you can still use a screen, but move. But I would say no screens 
because usually the kids would be in some sort of extracurricular or they come home and they have a snack or they just, you know, sort of go right from screen. No, that's not usually what happens in a school day. Usually you go do whatever your after school thing is. And some kids don't do those things. And I get that too. I'm trying to be, you know, all comprehensive, but ideally we want our kids to be doing something after school. That's a little play time, change their brain, free up their brain, get some exercise, do something creative, whatever club sport thing, or come home and uh, do if they don't have those. So no, I do not say, because they're going to want it, go right onto social media, go right onto gaming. I'm trying to normalize a day. So get a little fresh air, do a something do something that you're interested in, whatever their extracurricular activity interest would be, even if they're not in the art club or the Spanish club or the football team or, or the drama club or the robotics team, make them do something in that wheelhouse. Yeah, understood. Do that. And then later, if their homework's done, like you would do at school. See, the thing that people are forgetting because we're all over it, they're still in school. It's a school day. So trying to normalize a school day, like I don't think that parents let their, you know, would, would prefer, some do, the kids run right home and get on the games because we talked about that before COVID. We don't endorse that. You know, get a little exercise, do something creative, do something fun. Then when your homework's done, after dinner maybe, you can have a couple hours of gaming. I also, I've been more flexible. I've said, okay, give them more time because you know, the parents like, what do I do with them? Especially when there was no extra crickets and everyone was confined. It's like, ah, I get it, parents. I'm a parent. It's like, okay, just surrender. But it also, I want to make clear about this too. It's not blanket overall. So if someone, if a kid, let's just use gaming. If a kid actually pre-COVID had maybe a little issue with gaming. And Mandy, when Mandy did during the presentation that you hosted for the city of London, when she did that skit, it was like a Saturday Night Live skit, but it was scary because it was real. When she showed and demonstrated the parents engaging and trying to get these kids off of, of the gaming, it was so brilliant. So even before COVID, we had this, but what happened with COVID and confinement is that that just escalated and the kids are gaming now. The kids who did have a propensity or maybe some struggle, yes, it's accelerated and exacerbated like all things have. So if your kid has that issue with gaming, then no, I'm not going to say just let them have free reign. And the other thing is I want you to monitor it because the other thing, and this is a lot of my research now, um, you were talking about kids and everyone being locked up. Um, the cyberbullying that we all knew has been on, for lack of a better term, steroids. Right. And kids don't know, but now the kids are all bored. A lot of drama, a lot of gossip. They don't have the outlet. There's no gossiping in the halls. And the cyberbullying and the stuff that's going on is really, really terrible. It is, it is just... So you also want to check any changes in moods in your kids. You know your kid. If you see something doesn't feel right. Now, it's not. I have parents saying, oh, my gosh, they seem so sad. They walked upstairs and they, yeah, okay. They're being a teenager. They're being moody. So I'm not saying, because the parents usually at work, they don't know all the moods that a kid goes through, especially a teenager on a daily basis. So I'm not saying, you know, have all this kind of activation over, oh, my God, because you, you haven't been with your kids. But you need to notice and be more if something happens for more than a few days or you start to see your kid is changing, um, you might want to talk to them. It's a whole thing I do on cyberbullying because the kids just are sitting around and they're just bored. They're doing stuff. So That's the other thing, like for cyberbullying, like do you monitor your kids' devices and, you know, how do you, because I, I find that quite tricky because, you know, where is their boundary and how much are you able or, or you know, how much would you encourage you to monitor their devices and their conversations, which they'll tell you are private. And they are. And I'm just going to tell you, yes, then this is such a big topic. Um, they're going to jailbreak and find a way around it anyway, if they know you're monitoring it. So all that you're doing, and sometimes it's just right to send a message. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier, because it's not ideal. Um, no, I do believe, you know, the kids text now. 
So when the parents say, oh, they're on the device all the time, I'm like, yeah, but let's separate it out. And again, I'm not endorsing. I don't work for any company. I get no, nothing, you know, there's no reciprocity. So if I say Apple product, I just use it because it's a base a lot of people know. You know, there's that app on there called Screen Time that finally we can look at for the last couple of years since the California Teachers Association said to Apple, if you don't start monitoring this, we're pulling $2 billion of investment. Oh, suddenly Apple says, oh, well, we have this thing called Screen Time. Really? You just, what, you did that over the weekend, guys? Oh, no, you've had it. So then they launched it. So you can see, you can see where your kids are spending time on that because we used to talk on the phone. Kids don't talk on the phone. They text. Their communication is DM texting. They also create, and this is, these can be a little sketchy, like in Discord, they can create a little chat room, but kids don't talk. So you want to make sure kids need to stay communicated. We need to keep socializing them. So the time that we used to spend when, you know, my parents would be like, oh, they could finally surrender and got me my own phone line. They did. I wore them down because I was on the phone all the time as a teenager talking to my girlfriend. So they finally, first they tried that old call waiting, <laughs> but then I wouldn't click over when someone called. <laughs> so that failed. So finally I wore my friends down. They got me my own phone line, which is fine. But I was on the phone all the time talking. Kids now texting. So you want to make sure, let's give them, give them, let's try to be reasonable. Are they using their device to communicate? And it's important we all stay communicated, right? But monitoring, would you mon would you wanted your parents to monitor your phone calls back in the day? Oh. No, and it's not right and it's not fair. And I also tell parents, if you do it stealth and you don't tell them, I would beware because you might hear something and it might be real, it might not be, or they might know that you're that you're doing it and so they'll purposely have had kids do this where the parents are trying to monitor and stealth and the kids know it so they'll purposely say or text things just to activate their parents that are not true it's really awful but how do you go to your kid and say well i oh, saw your text or i think communication should be private that doesn't mean that i think you should let your kid there's certain websites that are not age appropriate and you should be but i'm going to go back to this i'm going to challenge parents you know your kid. And if something doesn't seem right, something's not right. And I told this story of how I did not try to get into this 14 years ago because I was trying to, uh, to do this. I had no idea what this was. So in 2008, my, we used to laugh. There was this thing called a Blackberry that seemed so long ago. We used to call it, do you remember what we called the Blackberry? Crackberry. Yeah, we thought that was funny. We were addicted to it, right? We had no idea. We were so naive. That was addictive. We could only text. But the inflection point when people ask me is when internet became mobile. That happened with the iPhone in 2008. So my little princess, who can have anything she wants, both of them can. They got me wrapped. Um, so she wanted this thing called this iPhone. I didn't know. I thought it was like a black word. Or what do I know? I was a digital immigrant. I don't know. And so, of course, I gave it to her. And do you remember how Newton apparently, allegedly discovered gravity? Mm -hmm. How? An apple falling on the ground. An apple fell out of a tree and apparently reportedly hit him in the head. Hashtag fake news. But that's what happened. And he tweeted that, whatever tweeting was back then. And suddenly Newton... Bless him. And he was amazing. I'm not trying to diss Newton. But Newton got credit for discovering gravity because as the story goes, I take fake news. Um, an apple fell out of the tree and hit him ahead and he went. Metaphorically, the same thing happened. An apple fell out of the tree and hit this guy in the head. It was called an Apple iPhone because I got my daughter this little thing that I didn't understand. And something happened. I'm not going to go into the story, but she, there was a, a form what we now know was cyber bullying. It wasn't bullying. All that happened, bless her, was that her little crew left her out of a picture. They'd all gone to the beach without her. And they all lied to her about where they were that day. And she saw a picture back when the kids were on Facebook before we came on it and destroyed it. And they all created their own things. Um, she saw that picture. I walked back into the room and I could tell by the back of my daughter's head that something was wrong. And I'm not saying I'm dad of the year. And it took me a while to try to get her to tell me, and it may have taken a bribe of a shopping spree at a store called Brandy Melville, which was super dope back then. Um, and then I found out what happened, and I realized I handed my kid a weapon that I didn't understand. And the whole way I got into this 14 years ago was try to be a good dad. 
I needed to understand this thing I just given my kid because I couldn't take it back. But this has become the cyberbullying has become really, really subtle. And the kids are sitting in the dark. And we wonder why depression and anxiety and self-harm and I can't even say it really suicide, which one is too many, which was stabilized for decades. Suddenly in 2012, we start seeing this incredible, crazy spike. And with their legit research. And in 2017, they replicated that study. And I was praying and hoping that the numbers would come down. And I'm such a geek and such a nerd that the kind of alerts that are on my phone, I'll also block all the alerts. You don't need them. Um, all the pushes, block those. That's basic. But um, I had the alert on my phone waiting because it takes a couple of years to clean data and analyze it. So I knew they did the study again in 2017. 2019 in October, the results came out and the numbers were higher. And it is not okay. These kids are struggling. So we can't identify really the variables of why the depression, anxiety, and all those bad, bad things for the kids are I've suddenly come out of nowhere. But you're never going to convince this guy. 2012, we saw it. Hmm. Snapchat, Instagram launched in when? Oh, 2011. Oh, I'm sure that's a coincidence. Mm. Completely. So, watch your kids. Now, I'm not saying they have a bad day or they're moody or they slam a door. They're being a teenager. Like, as a parent, any parent of teenagers who've been through it, like, we hear a door slam even accidentally. We still have PTSD because we grew up with teenagers. Like, and I'm sure we did it. You know, call them out there. You know, I'm sure. But it's not because they have a bad day or a bad afternoon or they don't want to talk to you. But if you start to see, and I mean this for parents, especially with COVID where the kids have nothing to do. So they're all comparing and despairing. They're all doom scrolling. They're all looking what's gone on in the world and they have nothing else to do. And the cyberbullying and the gossip and talk to your kid. Talk to your kid or have your kid talk to somebody, whether it's an older sibling or a teacher. I don't know. But if you feel there's something off and it seems like it's, you know, outside the bell curve, we're all in depression and anxiety about this confinement. I wouldn't say monitor their stuff without them knowing. Because if you do, and then you have to go to them and you tell them you've been monitoring them, then you breach the trust and then they'll never talk to you. It totally makes sense. And, you know, I think, but it's, it's so, it's such a difficult issue because, you know, you, it is like the boundaries are, I mean, it was a problem before COVID mm -hmm. and confinement and now it's become a problem on steroids. And, you know, it's so difficult because we're all living in this environment and trying to figure out, you know, what are they being exposed to? What are they doing with their days? You know, plus we're also busy. We're trying to hold full-time jobs, you know, so it's it's really not easy and you know you talk about devices as in telephones but or you know iphones or whatever androids but you know for instance my older son he does everything on his pc so everything he does his schoolwork on his pc he communicates on his pc he, he's in chat forums on discord on his pc he games on his pc so, you know, I mean, I'm sure he's on his phone too, but he gets off his, his PC, he comes down and goes on his phone, you know, and it's just like this continuum of a screen. Right. And then the only way I find to actually spend quality time with him, which I hate to admit, and it's slightly <laughs> pathetic, but it's like we watch Netflix at night, you know, Okay. because it's like, you know, we watch the Queen's Gambit or something nice that we can do together. And, but, you know, it's still a bloody screen. And so... How do you, is, is that terrible? Should we just surrender to the fact that this is our reality and just say, okay, this is temporary and it's okay and let's not beat ourselves up about it? Or should we do, should we do something differently? Nobody's going to do it perfectly. And that's when I said in the beginning, be flexible, be adaptable. However, watching Netflix, as long as now here, the same protocols that you've heard me talk about are still in play. Certainly during meals. What you said, model the behavior as a parent. Absolutely, because the kids have a good point. I do. I work with a lot of family. So I work with the kids, but I also have a private practice. And I work with adults and do family groups as well. And I say to the parents, you want to model the behavior because the kids have a point when they say, well, I'm bad. You should see mom. She's on it all the time. So there's certain things that are still stay in play. No one during meal times, And there's no reason now since we're all home that everyone can sit down for at least one meal a day, dinner, 
Like there's no traffic was late. I've got to work late. Yes. No one cares. Everyone's giving each other a lot of leeway and they should right now with timing, like things that we used to be so like that deadline, that deadline, everyone's like, Oh, COVID, COVID brain. So take advantage for your family. This is actually an amazing time for to spend time with your family. And I know people are like, Oh, I wanted to go back to school. It's like, you know, that had never ending summer vacation, but take the time at least there's no reason why a family shouldn't all be able to sit down for dinner every night now and stop everything because there's no time and space and everything is collapsed. No screens, lock up the phones, put the phones away, turn them off. So there's no distraction. You don't hear that being whose is that? Everyone's like catalog whose phone turn them off. But if you want to sit down and you want to watch Netflix together, yes. As long as no one has their phone, phones are away. It's family time. If you want to come up with family activities, you know, there's so many things and everyone rolls their eyes until they do it. Playing a board game. Oh, I can't do it, dad, until they get into it and they start getting competitive, going through and helping them. Even I tell parents, helping the kids. This is a time as a parent, a lot of us say, God, there's so much I would love to teach my kids, but I never have the time. So the coaches, the teachers, caregivers, nannies siblings, teacher kids, they're going to roll their eyes. You don't have to do it all the time, but this is a great time to teach your kids about your history, things you want them to learn. My mother, she's a resident beast, tricked me into learning how to fold a fitted sheet, which is a bit of a trick because she told me she needed help. She didn't need help. She said, oh, can you help me? She pretended she was struggling. She taught me how to fold a fitted sheet. She taught me how to do laundry, cooking, family recipes, this is a time when you can do a thing where you say, hey, let's do something nice for your friend. What is our, what, what, what is our family? What's like, and I'm making this up, a casserole, a cake, a dessert. A pie. There's every family has that one thing, the soup that they make that's passed down for generations. There's a lot of math in cooking. And as a parent pretending we're helpless, they'll roll their eyes, but oh, mom, dad, you're so helpless. Ask for help. Teach them how to make the family recipe and say, you know what, let's take this to your friend, your teacher, my, and have them help you. Say, oh, my God, my, um, one, of, I told, one of my uh, families, need, they wanted to go through the photo albums. I said, okay, go pull out the photo albums, and then when your kid's upstairs, drop them all. And, like, don't swear, but say, oh, my God. The kid will run downstairs and just have it that the photos all fell out on the floor and say, oh. And say to your kid, have your kid help you. So I get them to help you. And she, the kid, ended up, they went through all the family. She just pretended she was picking them up and they fell and they spilled. Now, I'm not saying that's perfect. I'm giving really weird outside because we all say as parents, when they go off to college or they go off to their life, we say, did I teach them enough? Did I tell them enough? Did I show them enough? There is no excuse now. It's not like every day they will roll their eyes. But to be able to spend this time with our kids, and our family, even if you just take an hour and you say, look, you don't have to take the gar take out the garbage, you don't have to do the dishes, but I need you to sit here for an hour with me and I wanna show you something. I wanna talk, and they'll hate it until they don't, but we no longer have the excuse that we all panic when they're 17 or 18 and say, did I prepare them, did I teach them? And it's also a great time for families, even if you're just doing a puzzle and talking, to be able to share your experience, strength, and hope with your kids that we all have said, I just don't have time. I wish I could tell my kids how to do it. I wish I could show them. I wish I could teach them. I wish I could teach them how to bake grandma's cake. I wish I could have them help me, you know, in the garden. I wish we could take the dog on a walk, but I never get home enough, early enough, and it's dark. And I've heard all of these things. Like, okay, well, now it's light. So why don't you and the kid... You say you wanted to take a walk around the block, but you always get home too late. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity in so many ways. And I think that's a really wonderful reminder, Don. You know, we, we do have this precious time to spend more time with our children. and They're going to hate it. They're not going to want to do it. I don't care if you have to bribe them mm. because you have this time. And it doesn't have to be every day, but certainly meals. Oh, also bedtime. No, same rules apply, Kiki. That phone, that device should not be in their room. They don't need it. They don't even need it now. They used to say, oh, it's my alarm. I said, say to kids, I'll buy you any alarm clock you want. 
Now the parents are home. They don't need it. But the same usual things, no devices, an hour at least before they go to sleep, those devices should be out of their rooms, stored, no laptops, no, they need to go to sleep. We need to keep them in the routine. Otherwise, when we do get to the other side of this, and we will, it's going to be a jarring readjustment of having to get up every day, get in the routine of getting up, getting dressed, getting to school, coming home. There, We have to keep that muscle memory and that stuff working while throughout the day we're helping their brain change like they're moving around in a school. But with, with if they roll their eyes and say they won't do it, whatever it is you want to engage them with, well, at a certain point they will. When this all does end, how do you think it will have changed our children, our society, the way we operate, our kids' brains, our own brains? Like, do you think there's going to be permanent sort of changes? And if so, what does that look like? That's a hefty one. Well, again, in neuropsychology and in brain chemistry, it depends on where their brains are. You know, our brains don't form until 25 or 26. So really the plasticity of the brain, it's setting, it's like jello until they're 25 or 26 and then it sets. But as far as the neurochemistry or the brain or what they're using, um, certainly we could posit that we could propose that if you're still, if they're gaming, yes, it's absolutely lighting up the wrong centers and darkening the, the other ones. Any fMRI can show that. But if they're in an age where they're much younger, Yes, of course, the neural pathways, because your brain is always pruning. You're teaching your brain what parts of the brain to use. And if you're focusing, now there's a lot of games actually, just to be fair, that can help buttress this online learning. And Common Sense Media is a great website. And I love these guys. Um, your work, you know these, you know the resources. So there's a lot of games that have to do with problem solving and math and learning. And I've been talking about that a lot and sharing those resources, but certainly like the dystopic universes, the first shooter games, the war games, all of those. Yeah. Those should be super limited. Like I say to parents, how much sugar do you like your kids having? Do you look at your kids sugar intake? I saw a woman at the grocery store and I rarely go because I'm trying to be careful, but she was teaching her daughter to look at peanut butter and the ingredients. The daughter was probably six or seven and the mom was taking the opportunity. And I just saw her, she was showing her daughter in peanut butter, which one to buy that, how much sugar is in some of the brands and that it was important if you're really going to have those nutrients. And then I watched and I wasn't trying to be like stalker, but I was watching because I was really thought this was great. She was taking this opportunity to teach her daughter shopping of how to read ingredients and what ingredients mean and that obviously the first one is the most in it and they go in descending order so if you buy peanut butter and you look at the ingredients and the last ingredient is peanuts <laughs> yeah but I, she was taking that opportunity to teach her daughter about shopping but i say to parents look perfect ground rule say that video games were sugar uh say devices were sugar how much sugar do you want your kid to have a day now they can have some and they can earn some dessert, but I look at it like as if it was sugar because it's the dietary for, it's a diet for your brain. So in terms of how much and all of that, it's up to every parent, but I also understand parents are fatigued too. And I've said to parents, they've said, Don, is I couldn't, I'm so sorry, true confession. I just gave my kid the PlayStation. I was like, I said, I get it. We're all struggling. The str hashtag the struggle is real for all of us. Well, I think that's, yeah, that's the question, like long-term, is this going to make mm -hmm. things harder? It probably is in some ways. I want you to impact that. Harder in what way? What do you mean? I guess rewiring their brains for, you know, getting used to being constantly on these screens and, and therefore, you know, I mean, I know my eldest, for instance, is so much more on his screens than he ever was before. And so coming out the other end for him, it's so normalized now to be on a screen, he'll come home and he'll be like, okay, I'm getting on my screen again, you know, and I'll be on my screen for hours. So I, I just wonder if it's having any sort of permanent changes where it's normalizing this sort of yeah. behavior. 
We'll see. But that's why I say when we can, it's not perfect, people. I know. That's what I'm saying throughout the school day, even like they do in class, make them get up between classes or if they're in one classroom and they're in elementary school, when they would take recess or breaks, take recess and breaks and nutrition after school. Try even if extracurriculars aren't available because you're confined. If they're into sports, make them go around and throw a Frisbee for the dog or do jumping jacks. If they're into art, make them do an art project. It's the best we can do to normalize it so they're not glued. But I am hoping, especially, I mean, look, as I've, you've heard me say, this is the only time in the history of the human race, and we are social animals. Aronson, you know, and wrote the book in 1901 about the social animal. We are social animals. We need socialization. This is the only time in history that the digital natives and the digital immigrants will cohabitate ever in history. After we've abdicated and the digital immigrants, the last of us are gone, then it's the digital natives and you don't miss what you don't know. When I teach about writing an actual love letter, they roll, people roll their eyes. When I talk about calling someone on their birthday and singing happy birthday, everyone thinks I'm a geek, but people appreciate it. I've done one of those today already. I won't tell you which one. Um, I've done both of them in the last few weeks. But keeping the sense of what keeps us human and connected, as we become more and more digitalized, as we see, uh, we don't know now, virtual reality, augmented reality, they're saying this might not be the thing, but artificial intelligence, absolutely. Robotics, absolutely. So remaining human, remaining connected, doing the things that we do, and I said to someone this morning when they had sent me a really nice gift and I called and I said, I know I could have emailed you or I could have texted you, but I was going to pick up the phone. I was going to go old school and thank you. That was so thoughtful. I was so nice. What a nice surprise last night when I came home and saw you'd sent me that gift. Just been, She said, I appreciate that. Hearing my voice and me actually going what my mother, she's a rest in peace, taught me. Write a thank you note or call. Kids hate it, but they don't know the experience of the dopamine and how it builds covalent bonds between people. They don't know what you're doing right now, nodding, reading affects in real life, subtle cues. However, I wasn't trying to do this. If I'd known what this all was, I've told you this too, you know, gosh, I was just trying to help my kid. I had no idea 14 years later, this thing that I thought was an ice flow was an iceberg upon an iceberg. And there's so many different things and it changes. But as one of the last digital immigrant generations and as a media psychologist and knowing what I know, I have to fight this. And I have to try to share with the digital, the digital natives some of the things I think are important about human connection. And again, you've heard me talk about this. Everyone has to sit through this when I present. But the one silver lining in this dark cloud, some of my work, Kiki, might have been done because one of the things I talk about is do not ever forget the value of being face-to-face -face in real life. You can text LOL all you want. It's never going to have the same impact, the same psychological dopamine imprinting effect of laughing out loud with your friends in the same space. So the idea that I keep talking about, about don't forget about what, how important it is for us to be together, do things face-to-face, -face, not just rely on texting. This confinement may have done it. I'm hearing my little digital native clients say, God, I just, I really miss being with people. Mm. That's what I've been trying to tell you for years. That's my old basis. Do not forget. So the one thing of us not being able to be together, even adults, as we leaned into only communicating through text and, and social media, I'm hopeful that this might have been a good lesson learned for these kids of the value of being with your friends in real life. And not just so that when we come out of this, I think that they, hopefully they can hold it and remember what it's like to only be reliant. They got what they wanted. I say that winking. Don't have to see anyone, can do everything on a device. How do you like it? And I'm telling you, increasingly more of the kids, they don't like it. They miss that. So I've been laughing, saying my work may be done. This virus may have done, this confinement may have done. The only reason I did this was so that these kids who don't know any better and never knew any better and were, this was thrust upon them, 
may now understand the value of what it's like to actually be together with others having experiences. Absolutely. Well, that's really wonderful. I love that, Don, and that's very beautiful. And I, I'd like to end on that note of hope and optimism. But I have to say, you've been amazing. You've given us some fantastic tips and some fantastic insights and thoughts. And I'm really grateful. Is there anything that we've left out? If they listen to nothing else, and again, this is just my opinion, I'm going to give the five W's and H for parents of device use and utilization. Here's the questions, right? Review and think about these things. And also, sorry, you can also think about this for yourself as well. So the questions are the, the five W's and the H. So why are you or they engaging? What's the motivation or goal, right? What are you or they doing on your devices and screens? Could it be accomplished another way? Where are you or are they using the device in the environment or home? In other words, locked up in their rooms, in the dark, or in a public space together? Or what? When are you or are they engaging? All night long? During the morning? When? Anytime you can? Who are you or are they engaging with? And are they safe? And is it going to be healthy for you once you've engaged? How are they engaging or not? That's about online impression management and causes and conditions of safety. So why are you, are they engaging? What are you, are they doing on the screen? Where are you, are they using the screen? When are you, are they using it? Who are you, are they using or engaging with? How are they engaging or not? And remember, technology is great. Devices are great, but they are not replacements for the things that really keep us human, make us human. And everything we do on, everything online is forever archived somewhere. So it's like this jump rope that never ends. So if you're experiencing FOMO where they say, oh, I've got to get on or I've got to do this. Well, the good thing is, and this is maybe the, what I'd like to leave with. Even if you take a break or a digital detox or break from gaming or social media, it's a never ending jump rope. It is forever, ever. Everything is somewhere, even if it's been deleted, it's always somewhere on a server, on a platform, somewhere. You, you won't miss anything. You're missing nothing. And you can always go back. It's being beamed out into space. I have every confidence that if there are, and I don't know, I'm not making a pain about alien life, but if they're receiving any of this, the Kardashians alone are going to convince them to say, oh, that planet no, 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 let's, I think, let's avoid it. I think because everything's being beamed out into space, but it's always there. But I'm going to challenge parents and kids, especially when we were talking about this is the only time, even though you're so over it and you want to, you know, this is the only time we're going to have this precious time with our families and kids. This was a gift, even though it feels like a liability and it's really wearing and we've been doing it too long, but this was it. Um, so those moments, the things that are online, everything can be, is discoverable. But there are moments, every moment in real life, it only comes once. If you miss it, I don't care if it's a sunset that was a spectacular, I don't care if it's the smell of, you know, the, the, the fall or the summer, or the person who could be your very best friend or someone you love is going to walk by you. And if you're looking down and they're looking down, you're going to miss it. But life is moments only happen one time. So take an opportunity to look up, look around because those screens, anything on them, you're not missing it. You can always, it's a jump rope because you can always jump in and jump out. It's always going to be there. But the moments now and these moments with our families, even when they're wearing, this is it. That these those life's moments only happen. Uh, you're right. Don, you're such a philosopher. You're so right. And I love that. But thank you so much for your time, Don. That's been amazing. And I really, I think you've left us with some fantastic takeaways in terms of how to do safe and healthier device management and also spend more time with our families. And it's just been very beautiful and helpful. So thank you so much for your time. 
Thank you so much for listening to the Mind Health 360 show. I hope that we've helped you realize that mental health symptoms have root causes that can and need to be addressed in order to sustainably heal and have given you some ideas about steps you, your loved ones, or clients may take to start their healing journey. Please share this interview with anyone you think may find it helpful, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with our latest interviews on integrative mental health. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. This information is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or to replace medical advice. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner before discontinuing any medication or implementing any changes in your diet, lifestyle, or supplement program.